He's a rock star who just so happens to make amazing films. That's right, John Carpenter has written, directed, and musically scored some of the most influential genre flicks ever to be put on the big screen. Bringing excitement and artistry to action thrillers, science fiction extravaganzas, and of course, horror. You know, the scary kind. The way he uses the camera to tell stories and explore the human condition is simply genius. A master of tone, tension, and world building. He plays with dark, thought-provoking narratives, yet he pretty much refuses to analyze any of his films. Does he just make movies about monsters, aliens, and killers? Or are these monsters, aliens, and killers representations of darker themes that he's trying to explore? And that mystery brings beauty to the career of John Carpenter. Is he just a dude with a guitar and some really wide lenses trying to show us a good time at the movies? Or is he the voice of a generation that influenced conversations about what it means to be a, a, a thing? John Carpenter, it's a name that's so powerful that the studios let him keep it over the frickin' titles of his frickin' movies. That name John Carpenter, well it's a name that strikes fear and wonder whenever it's mentioned. Like now, when I'm mentioning it, John Carpenter, see you felt fear and wonder. Here's some movie math for you. Steven Spielberg plus Wes Craven divided by Brian De Palma equals John Carpenter? Does that make sense? But the dude hasn't directed a film in over 12 years. So it's time we ask in the most respectful of ways, what the f happened to John Carpenter? Oh, and please make sure you like, share, subscribe, obey, and consume. She's a bitch. But to truly understand what the f happened to John Carpenter, we must begin at the beginning, and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, New York. 1948. Probably on a dark and stormy night, I don't know. John Carpenter would enroll at the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts in 1968, where he would make the short film Captain Voyeur, which in 2011 was actually selected for preservation by the National Film Preservation Foundation. While at USC, young Johnny Boy would learn from the greats, literally the greats. He would attend lectures with legends like Alfred Hitchcock, John Ford, Howard Hawks, and Orson Welles. As a student, John would co-write, edit, and compose the music for the Academy Award-winning short, The Resurrection of Bronco Billy in 1970, proving to be a jack of all trades from the beginning. With that experience under his belt, John Carpenter decided to leave film school to focus on making films, which would lead to collaborating with future alien writer Dan O'Bannon on the film Dark Star in 1974. It's a space comedy with a similar structure to Alien, but this time the alien looks like a beach ball. And it's funny. It's funny because it's a parody of Alien, but it came out before Alien, from the writer of Alien. <laughs> Due to the film's low budget, Carpenter and O'Bannon were forced to take several roles themselves, which led to them receiving high praise within the industry. The movie-making industry. Everybody instantly respected John Carpenter's ability to execute low-budget films. That would lead John Carpenter to be hired to direct the $100,000 budgeted Assault on Precinct 13 in 1976. Mr. John says that he was inspired by films such as Rio Bravo and Night of the Living Dead. You know the structure, a group of different characters trapped in one location with a threat among them and outside. This trademark story would be repeated in The Thing and Prince of Darkness. Assault on Precinct 13 would receive an X rating from that pesky MPAA for that infamous scene depicting a graphic death of a young girl. Carpenter would agree to cut the scene, resulting in an R rating, yet then shipped the film to theaters with the graphic scene still in the film. A true cinematic rebel right there. 
Assault on Precinct 13 was not an immediate hit, with so-so reviews and a low box office, but it would quickly find a following and become a cult classic, and it's now regarded as one of the best exploitation films ever made. After co-writing his first studio film, Eyes of Laura Mars, he would go and co-write, direct, and score one of the most quintessential horror films ever made, John Carpenter's Halloween, in 1978. This was the first time that he brilliantly marketed himself to the world. Just put his name right there, see? John Carpenter's Halloween, it's my movie, he said. It's my name, remember it. And we did. He was approached by producers who just wanted to make a babysitter murder movie. That's pretty much all they had. And Carpenter would agree to do this babysitter murder movie only if he got full creative control. And in a true measure of his faith in this film, Halloween, on a sharp $600,000 budget, Carpenter insisted on taking no upfront fee, but retaining 10% of the film's profits. Cha-ching! Halloween was released on October 25th, 1978, and word started to spread and people finally started to understand this man's vision. And nearly 44 years since its release, it has gone down to be regarded as the number one greatest horror film ever made. Well, you know, one of them. And it set a new standard for the genre. I like saying that, genre. In order to scare us, John Carpenter did not need a huge budget or lots of blood, just some shadows and a William Shatner mask. Of course, in its wake, there was Halloween 2, which John Carpenter reluctantly returned to write and produce, even though Carpenter felt that after the first film, he really didn't think there was any more story left to tell, but the studio disagreed. After making the TV movie, Someone's Watching Me, and the TV movie, Elvis, starring a very young Kurt Russell, John Carpenter would get a reputation as a filmmaker who could make movies on a strict budget, yet yield strong returns. Cha-ching. How was it, Mr. Denny? What do you think? He would continue pumping out genre-defining films, such as 1980's $21 million grossing The Fog, that only cost like $1 million to make. The Fog was cheap, simple, yet highly effective and terrifying. It's what Mr. Carpenter does. That was followed by 1981's $25.2 million grossing Escape from New York, with a production budget around $5 million. It's a dark, gritty picture that pushes the boundaries and expands on the cinematic tradition of the strong, silent badass. John Carpenter took advantage of a recently burnt down section of St. Louis and transformed it into his post-apocalyptic wasteland that if you can make it there, you, you can make it anywhere. And John Carpenter, alongside his favorite actor, Kurt Russell, they made it happen there. And Escape from New York is the film that made Robert Rodriguez want to be a filmmaker, which totally explains Spy Kids. And then, with a larger budget of $15 million, Carpenter would direct The Thing in 1982. This would be the first box office bomb of his career, pulling in just 19 million. Of course, as with the bulk of Carpenter's films, The Thing has gone on to be recognized as one of the greatest science fiction horror films ever made. No, one of the greatest films ever made, with even John Carpenter calling it his favorite film of his. In this film, John Carpenter plays with suspense so well he keeps you on the edge of your seat. You feel trapped right alongside this amazing ragtag team of characters that, of course, only John Carpenter could bring to life. And the practical effects of this creature have still, to this day, yet to be topped. I don't really want to say this, but I'm going to say it. The Thing is a perfect movie. There, I said it. I said it. Clear. With the poor box office showing of The Thing, everybody blamed on E.T., Carpenter says that the offers stopped flowing in. 
How ironic is that his best film kind of hurt his career? Whatever, everything happens for a reason, right? When asked why he wanted to adapt the Stephen King novel Christine, he said that it was the only thing offered to him at the time. And yeah, Christine has a lot of flaws, but it's a fun ride. The following year, Mr. Michael Douglas would approach the filmmaker to direct Starman, which John Carpenter immediately accepted, as he saw it as a way to make his vision of a romantic comedy. Because that's what everybody wanted, a John Carpenter romantic comedy. But you know what? Strangely enough, it works. You know, how do you make a romantic comedy better? You add aliens, and that's what he did. Starman is refreshing. It's nice to see John Carpenter show off his softer side. And this film resulted in John Carpenter directing Jeff Bridges in an Oscar-nominated performance, which is an impressive feat, considering genre flicks like this usually don't get much Oscar love. Critics gave Starman very high praise, noting that it seemed to not be in the director's wheelhouse, yet was unmistakably his. After turning down Top Gun, he would take on another film that would be a box office disaster yet become a cult classic in the years that followed, with the $11.1 million grossing Big Trouble in Little China. Which yeah, how do you market this thing? You, you, just, you just have to watch it. It can only be described as an action-packed kung fu fantasy adventure comedy with elements of horror that's accompanied by a music video from John's band, the Coupe de Villes. Big Trouble in Little China is a wild and crazy time at the movies. When you watch this movie, it feels like John Carpenter is just reminding everybody that movies are supposed to be fun. And the way he messes with your expectations on what a strong hero is supposed to be, and it's absolutely hilarious. He gets the actor who played Snake Plissken and tells him to pretty much do the opposite with it, and it's amazing. Big Trouble in Little China is such a unique film that only John Carpenter could make because he's such a unique filmmaker. After Big Trouble in Little China struggled at the box office, Carpenter would again have trouble finding funds for his films. Apparently, you need money to make movies. So he would revert back to low-budget filmmaking with the 1987 supernatural horror Prince of Darkness in 1987. Like I said, this one has a bunch of interesting characters trapped in a place, surrounded by a mysterious evil force. It's the perfect story for John. And of course, in true John Carpenter fashion, Prince of Darkness gained a cult following in the years since its release. He's a filmmaker always ahead of his time. Prince of Darkness has moments that will absolutely haunt your dreams, which I guess makes them nightmares. Yeah, that's what this movie feels like. It feels like John Carpenter is filming a nightmare. You would finish out the 80s with They Live. This film is notable for several reasons. It helped inspire many conversations from people who like to think about stuff. This film stands out amongst his others because this one, John Carpenter actually kind of talks about what the film means to him. Carpenter says that it's a statement on consumerism and greed during the Reagan era. Yeah, it's really out of character for him to comment on the message of the movie. I guess one would call this a uh, social commentary, but it's never preachy. It's fun. But the true beauty of They Live is that even though John Carpenter said it's about this, people from all parts of the political spectrum can get an interesting interpretation of it. And yeah, that continues to this day. Seriously, there's a new They Live meme like every day. And yeah, that Obey thing, that was, that was inspired by this. But yeah, They Live, it's the perfect metaphor for waking up. Whatever waking up means to you. And we cannot forget that infamous six minute fight scene which is something you gotta do when your movie's starring a pro wrestler. I'm gonna play the whole clip and fast forward now, just cuz. I'm telling you, you dumb son of a- <laughs> Look at them, they're everywhere! Maybe they can see Alley 5th and Spring.
In the early 90s, there were many John Carpenter films that fell through the cracks because of a contract dispute with a production company. John Carpenter's career was kind of in limbo right now. Enter Chevy Chase, who always saves the day. This funny man who didn't want to be funny at this time was in the middle of working on memoirs of an invisible man. Chevy Chase found the original script to be too comedic and wanted a more serious tone, so he brought in John Carpenter and said, hey, make this less funny, because that's what we want from a Chevy Chase movie. Warner Brothers were reportedly reluctant to hire Carpenter, as they saw him as solely a horror filmmaker. But Chevy convinced the studio, and this happened. I think the Washington Post said it best. They wrote that this film suffers from an identity crisis. Yeah, it just doesn't know what it wants to be. Is it scary? Is it funny? Is it thrilling? Is it... I don't know. It's got some interesting special effects for the time, though. But yeah, memoirs of an invisible man starring Chevy Chase. It's John Carpenter's biggest flop. Flopping around all over the place. His next film wouldn't fare much better, though. Although it is truly an underrated masterpiece. In the Mouth of Madness. It's an homage to H.P. Lovecraft and Stephen King. Lead actor Sam Neill gives a fantastic performance, but like with a lot of John Carpenter's films at the time, critics would be split on it. Some say it wastes an intriguing premise, but they're wrong. So there's that. But this thing would only make nine million at the box office. <laughs> Then came something called Body Bags, which was originally supposed to be like a Tales from the Crypt type show, but that didn't really happen, so they just made it an anthology film featuring stories from John Carpenter and Toby Hooper. But John seems to be having fun hosting this. John Carpenter presents Body Bags. For Carpenter, the rest of the 90s seemed to be misfire after misfire. Whether it was his take on demented children with Village of the Damned, another box office bomb, or his attempt to mix his two favorite genres, horror and westerns, with the film Vampires in 1998. This film cost $20 million and barely broke even. And yeah, Vampires is definitely a lesser John Carpenter film, but it's still fun as heck. I think this film gets way too much hate. But Vampires does try way too hard to be cool. And nothing that's actually cool tries to be cool. He would even attempt to revisit one of his most popular films with a sequel, Escape from L.A. However, with an amped up budget of $50 million, audiences didn't show up. And it flopped at the box office. I can't believe this sequel was even made. I hate to say this, but it's an embarrassing excuse for a movie. It straight up becomes a parody of itself, and not in a good way. Horrible CGI. Just horrible. Oh my god, why? Since the turn of the century, John Carpenter has only directed two films. 2001's Ghost of Mars, that was originally envisioned as Snake Plissken Escapes from Mars. Which sounds better than what we got. Yeah, Ghosts of Mars, it's just a lazy mess of a movie. It felt like this once great artist had truly lost his vision, his magic. Like somebody got his talent and just sent it up to Mars and it just stayed there and died. Of course, Ghosts of Mars would be a commercial and critical flop. So much so that it made John Carpenter vow to leave Hollywood for good and never return. Yet he would receive some solid reviews for his work on the anthology series, Masters of Horror. It's pretty good, but still not, you know, what he used to be. But hey, it was enough to reinvigorate him, and in 2010, he would direct The Ward, starring Amber Heard. John Carpenter says that the script came to him at the exact right moment. He was intrigued by the single location setting of the film. But sadly, yet again, The Ward, it failed to strike a chord with audiences or critics. Yes, this mediocre thriller flopped at the box office. Critics called it a sad swan song for Carpenter. But how dare they assume he's done. But the later films in his career force us to ask the question, did John Carpenter fall victim to the aging director curse? Are films like The Ward, Escape from L.A., and Ghosts of Mars 
Are films like that the reason why Quentin Tarantino says he's gonna retire before he gets too old? Is filmmaking a young man's game? Young person's game? John Carpenter would return to the world of movies, but not directing. This time he would help shape a new era of horror by executive producing a true sequel to his original hit Halloween, because it ignores all the other sequels. So they decided to call this sequel to Halloween, Halloween, but not the Rob Zombie Halloween. It's, it's, it's not confusing at all, but it wasn't bad and would spawn two more sequels, Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends. And in doing so, John Carpenter would transition into what seems to be his genuine passion, music. Rock and roll! The dude would even go on tour, jamming all of his best tunes from all of his best films, like the true rock star he is. John Carpenter even released several albums, proving once again that rock and roll and film are the best of bedfellows. He would collaborate with his son Cody and godson Daniel Davies on the musical scores for the three new Halloween films that have amassed over $386 million worldwide with still more to come. In addition to those scores, John, Cody, and Daniel have composed music for the 22 remake of that Stephen King movie, Firestarter and that new Foo Fighters film, Studio 666. Cut! And that's where we find ourselves today. John Carpenter may never direct another film, and that seems to be perfectly fine by him. Because almost every movie he made, and every score he played, left to their mark in cinematic history. No matter what he does, if he does anything, that's always going to be there, and no one can take that away from him. Cinema, to John Carpenter, was instinctual. He really understands the language of film and music, and this guy sure does play by his own rules. A true independent spirit making true independent cinema, who always takes risks and was willing to sacrifice huge opportunities just to tell the stories he wants to tell. His films remind us of the importance of a director. You can see that this is a vision of one man, one artist. Instead of just an assembly line of executives who just want to sell like Mike Myers Funkos, the atmospheres that he creates in his cinematic worlds are truly distinct. You can always tell that you're watching a John Carpenter film from the first frame projected on the screen or streamed on your phone or whatever. We can truly appreciate his films based on all the crappy remakes. No one has been able to top him. And yeah, those remakes, Johnny Boy seems to hate him. But he sure does love the paychecks he gets from those remakes. Like honestly, when someone says The Thing, The Fog, Assault on Precinct 13, or Halloween, everyone instantly imagines the original. And that's exactly what John Carpenter is. An original. And y'all wouldn't have your precious Stranger Things without him either. Nobody should give a f about what the f happened to John Carpenter, because he's doing just fine.